Hi, thank you, Mark. Hello, Hi, Mark. everyone. Um, first, we would like to thank the uh, Nautical Archaeology Society for inviting, inviting us to speak at this webinar series. Um, we are also grateful to the Honor Frost Foundation for supporting this webinar series and a large part of academic and capacity building initiatives in Lebanon. And I am very happy to be speaking to you today as this is a project that is dear to my heart. Um, throughout my 20 plus years, I'm not bragging here, but anyway, of diving in the waters of Lebanon, I was able to visit most of the sites that we are going to uh, explore together today. And the idea of documenting this less known aspect of Lebanese heritage has been brewing uh, in, in my head for, for the past decade or so. So much so that I had encouraged the fellow maritime archaeologist to do her MA thesis on the subject at the Center for Maritime Archaeology in Southampton back in 2015. And now finally, with the support of HFF, my team and I are able to put this project into practice. So as part of our presentation today, we will first talk about Lebanon and a brief overview of main historical events from the late 19th century to present times, just to give a rapid overview of the context we are concerned with and demonstrate how these major events are reflected in the underwater cultural heritage of the time, as well as the legal framework protecting the UCH of Lebanon. We will then explore what we are doing uh, within the framework of this project, what we call the MSP project, so Modern Shipwreck uh, Project, and why we are undertaking such uh, an endeavor. We will introduce our brilliant team, our twofold methodology joining together desk-based research and field investigation. And then we will present a, a modest case study that illustrates a few of the useful information we can extract from our methodology and finally, we will end with a few ideas we have for the future in terms of collaborations, uh, dissemination, public engagement, as well as heritage manage management plans. So we are dreaming big. And now I will let my colleague Sergio take the lead. Thank you, Lucy. So first we will talk about the geography of Lebanon for those who don't know where we are. Uh, right there in the eastern Mediterranean, we have, uh, we're bordered by Syria in the north and in the east, and we're bordered by uh, Palestine in the south and the Mediterranean Sea in the west. So this strategic location between uh, Europe, Africa, and Asia, uh, and because of our varied topography and the natural, natural resources that we have, this made Lebanon, this, this gave us a strategic location. And uh, this caused us to be a thriving maritime and seafaring nation since ancient times. So if we move over quickly to the historical timeline that we are concerned with, uh, our main period of interest in Lebanon's recent history is uh, the main events that went on from the 19th to the 20th century and resulted in the presence of a lot of shipwrecks along the Lebanese coast and offshore. Uh, so because it is the 19th and 20th century, the majority of, or all of our shipwrecks actually are metal. Um, so let's start with the 19th century. In 1840, we had the Oriental Crisis, which was basically, uh, it was when uh, Muhammad Ali Pasha uh, declared himself ruler of Egypt and southern Syria, away from the Ottoman Empire, and this caused a clash. And basically, the whole Ottoman navy joined Muhammad Ali Pasha in Egypt, and European powers had to intervene and try to engage the defected Ottoman uh, navy. Uh, but somehow they managed to bomb Sidon and Beirut along the way. Uh, then, fast forward to 1860, we had a like a civil war, a sectarian strife between the Maronites and the Druze in Lebanon, and France had to intervene and they, they landed troops in Beirut and they, they had a presence uh, in the region. Uh, but before that happened, sorry, I forgot. Oh no, that's right. Uh, so because of that, the English uh, wanted to protect their sea route between India and Britain. 
and they wanted to have a bigger presence in the Eastern Mediterranean. So this is why they deployed a huge fleet uh, in front of Lebanon, the Eastern Mediterranean. And they used to have annual uh, summer exercises in front of Tripoli, which is in the north of Lebanon. And basically what happened, the famous HMS Victoria collided with another ironclad battleship and sank quickly and uh, 300 and so, uh, 330 uh, crew of the ship died, including the, the, uh, the captain of the boat, which was the commander of the whole fleet. Uh, then in 1912, there was a clash between the Italian Navy and the Ottoman Navy. Uh, and with this engagement, they actually bombed Beirut port and Beirut city. In 1915 and 1918, which is World War I, the Allies did the maritime blockade of Lebanon, uh, and this led to the Great Famine. Then in World War II, 1940 to 1945, there was various battles in front of Lebanon. A lot of ships were sunk by the U-boats, the German U-boats, uh, but also during the Allied offensive into Vichy held Lebanon in 1941. And these events uh, led to the end of the French mandate and the Lebanese independence. Uh, then after that, between 1975 and 1990, we had a civil war, which resulted in mostly cargo ships being sunk all over the country. So as Sergio quite uh, brilliantly explained, he set the scene, the historical scene for our shipwrecks. Um, so here we define the shipwrecks that we are looking into as watercraft dating from the 19th century to present times. Now, due to their recent nature, as you can imagine, most of the wrecks are made from steel. Uh, they are about 262. Uh, potential submerged track sites along the coast of Lebanon with, as you can see from the map, clusters centered around the major harbor cities. In the north, you've got Tripoli, then the capital Beirut, and uh, Sidon, the port of Sidon in the south. And uh, in, uh, that is in addition to a few other wrecks that are located offshore. Um, now, this data, as we will see in the next slides, was compiled through, as we said, both text-based research and results from marine geophysical surveys that were supported by HFF in the past decade in Lebanon. So what type of ships are we talking about? They range between military and cargo. Um, they are quite varied. There are freighters, coasters, liners, cargo carriers, uh, battleships, tankers, torpedoes, submarines, you name it. And they were all operating in the Eastern Mediterranean, as Sergio explained. So they are either uh, made internationally uh, in France and England and so on, or they are locally made. They are powered through uh, uh, with sail um, by steam or by diesel. Now, uh, as a result of the numerous peaceful times uh -huh, that we got so far, um, these ships sunk either uh, they were either directly involved in the conflict itself, so naval battles, uh, and sunk as a result, or they foundered as a result of tangen tangential activity, such as transporting raw materials for the war or transporting people fleeing conflict zones and so on. So this is why uh, we stress that these wrecks have a historical value to, due to them uh, being part of a conflict, and hopefully when they reach the 100 years uh, benchmark set by the UNESCO 2001 convention, they will become uh, legally protected. So these, when we think of shipwrecks and these shipwrecks specifically, we think of diving and it comes as no surprise that a large number of these wrecks are widely known locally and dived on. They are uh, part of the websites on travel blogs about Lebanon, uh, on Facebook pages of dive clubs. They, you know, since Lebanon has a very, uh, we don't have a rich fauna and flora, right? Like uh, in the Red Sea. So these wrecks become an attraction, an attractive asset for dive centers and dive operators. 
um, so you surely can, you know, be more interested as a diver to visit a lost ship at sea than a desolated seabed with just, you know, rocks and, and sand with with what little very little remains of uh, remain of uh, Lebanon's marine life. So, however, with this practice and this diving tourism comes a set of problems and challenges that the modern wrecks of Lebanon are facing. Uh, the first of these, uh, but not only, of course, would be um, how divers behave when they visit these wrecks. So, um, most of, perhaps divers, do, most, most of them do not, you know, do it on purpose. They are just not aware that um, they contribute to corrosion and erosion through touch, uh, abrasion, through the bubbles, through uncontrolled wreck penetration. Uh, they pick up small souvenirs because they think, you know, well, if I don't pick it up, you know, someone else will. Um, but also, um, it's very strange in, in, in Lebanon, and, and I don't know, I would be interested to know from our audience if this practice is done elsewhere, we have these wrecks become some sort of memorial uh, places where, for example, you find the uh, statue in the picture of a local saint, Saint Charbel, uh, worshipped by the Maronite community or the Catholic uh, uh, community in Lebanon. Um, and uh, next to it, uh, you've got the insignia of the army that commemorates uh, the martyrs lost the soldier lost during one one of the most famous battles uh, against ISIS in, in recent years. Um, common threats also include ghost nets as a result of fishing activity. Um, some of these nets are quite uh, deep and uh, so they are targeted by trawlers and we all know that as a consequence um, that uh, impacts negatively the shipwreck because part of the hull or the uh, structural, or structural components of the shipwreck gets entangled in these, uh, in these nets. Another way that fishermen catch fish, uh, probably less nowadays than during the Civil War, is through dropping makeshift dynamite bundles for the sake of fishing out groupers and larger fish that normally live at these uh, depths. Um, nowadays, this uh, this practice has, is being curbed a bit by the by the government, and um, you know fishermen make sure to inform other fishermen, you know about about this practice and so on. So, however, um, you can see when you visit uh, several metal shipwrecks uh, that there are crates and explosion signature that leave their marks on the hulls um, and you know, with time, uh, this contributes to the destruction and eventually the disappearance of, of the wreck. Some of the wrecks are sometimes also sold to salvage companies for metal scrapping when they become impossible to repair. And this is common practice everywhere. However, in Lebanon, it hasn't always been a legal undertaking and um, uh, some amateur salvagers uh, drop makeshift also bombs onto the wrecks to recover any piece of uh, scrap they can get. Um, these uh, such activities also thrived during the civil war where there was no control, no government and so on. And, you know, people just needed to get by the best way they knew how or, or could manage to. And some of the scrap and, and looting of, you know, little small memorabilia uh, of uh, doorknobs and uh, whatnot you know, um, become part of, of personal uh, collections. As we mentioned earlier, the wrecks, since they are popular diving spots, so boats, diving boats, uh, anchor to, to a buoy that is usually fixed to the wreck uh, in order to uh, drop the divers nearest to the dive site. Uh, this anchoring system is usually made, as seen in the pictures, of metal ropes and chains which cause friction and eventually, as you probably, <laughs> you know, can imagine, destruction of features due to the underwater movement and dynamic of currents and, and storms. This is the example of the uh, shipwreck uh, of the LSS uh, Lesbian. 
which lies at a depth between 55 to 65 meters, a few uh, hundred meters from the northern mole of the port of Beirut, right in the circle, the yellow circle on the map. Um, it has wrecked in uh, 41, and since then it has been used as an offshore anchorage by visiting ships. Uh, remains of ropes and damages to the hull and the overall structure of the ship can be observed, but they never were assessed in their entirety. So, you know, a, a detailed uh, survey of the CERC is highly warranted. And here um, we got a, a bit of snapshots to show you the amount of ropes and entanglements that the um, shipwreck uh, is, is suffering. Now, uh, another uh, fruit, uh, how can I say, uh, destructive event that happened um, is the Beirut, uh, the Beirut port explosion in, uh, in August. Uh, and the, radi the, the explosion was heard as far as uh, Cyprus. Um, still, damages to the underwater uh, heritage or underwater wrecks um, around the uh, Beirut blast radius has not been uh, fully investigated. Uh, however, a colleague of ours, a fellow diver, uh, Elie Saliba, um, has uh, undertaken a, a couple of photographs that he posted on social media to show the destruction uh, to the wreck brought by uh, the radius of the blast. Uh, last but not least, uh, there is also the problem of land reclamation. This is the example of the Champollion shipwreck, which wrecked very close to uh, the coast, like as you can see in the uh, map in red, in the red circle. And now nothing exists uh, of the shipwreck because it has been uh, removed uh, completely ahead of any survey work and uh, was covered by uh, a new uh, runway that was built for the airport nearby. Um, an additional, um, so th this, this extension of the airport and of the runway of the airport is just one example of a rampant coastal urbanization that's been happening since the civil war uh, where you know people fleeing from their villages uh, and remote areas come to the city and uh, to the coast and settle there in a non you know uh, a planned ma manner and this you know starts causing landfills to take over the sea and therefore um, threatens the presence of shipwrecks that are located by the coast in addition, uh, this growing urbanization and the uh, corruption that we live in has also resulted in increased levels of sewage, untreated wastewater and solid waste that uh, pollute different pollutants uh, that uh, run uh, through rivers and through, uh, uh, like you can see in the, in the uh, upper left uh, corner, or through sewage uh, systems that directly empty the waters in the sea. Uh, another uh, problem is the um, trash dump sites that are located just by the sea. This is an, just one example of many on the coast of Lebanon. To this, you can add a, a, a heavy industries, the presence of heavy industries along the coast of Lebanon. Uh, with uh, waters um, dispersing arsenic, lead, zinc, you name it, chromium, uh, discharging in, in, in the sea. And so this threatens not only the survival of marine life, but also metal wrecks, because chemical and biological action contribute to the degradation of an already fragile metal core. The offshore exploitation of gas and petrol it has been halted now, but uh, it had started a few years ago in Lebanon without uh, a detailed assessment of the presence of the archaeology uh, in offshore waters. And this, you know, might cause a threat uh, to, uh, to submerged uh, shipwrecks, especially um, in deep waters. Um, last
last but not least, um, we need to take in, we, we cannot anymore uh, talk about any threat to the archaeology, whether on land or underwater, without, you know, the importance of climate change as the, the water temperature is rising, as the salinity is, is rising in the Mediterranean. Uh, adding to that, all the, um, the threats from chemical dumps and waste dumps that I mentioned before, um, all that, uh, you know, only contributes to the corrosion rates, uh, a, high cor a higher corrosion rates with time of, um, of the metal shipwrecks. Now, if you, you, you would think then, okay, so there should be some sort of legislation that protects these wrecks. So if we go back to the national legislation, legislation, we can see that the 1933 laws of antiquities that, st that is still in vigor in Lebanon now does not at all mention underwater cultural heritage. It's only in 2006 that Lebanon adopted the uh, Arabic version of the UNESCO 2001 convention and it's only in 2008 that underwater cultural and heritage is mentioned at all in the national legislation. If we look at the international conventions, um, Lebanon has signed several conventions warranting the protection and preservation of the uh, cultural heritage, but none of, uh, the, uh, uh, of these conventions, except these two that I'm listing here, the UN clause and the UNESCO 2001 convention, only these, um, you know, consider the protection, the protection of underwater cultural heritage. However, there's a twist. Contemporary shipwrecks are made of iron steel and they become uh, highly prone, as we said, to erosions and so on. So if they're made of steel, they are, for most of them, younger than the 100 year benchmark that is set by the UNESCO 2001 convention. Hence our race with time. Um, there's no, these wrecks face uh, a large set of challenges. They are not protected by any uh, legislation until now. Um, and here I would like to share with you a quote from uh, Delgado and Varmer in 2015 that government, whether government or people, need to see that although, you know, in, in writing uh, these wrecks are not um, part of the protected by the legislation yet, however, uh, they constitute, um, they are a repository of cultural, historical, uh, and socio-economic uh, um, parameters or uh, information about a specific area in time uh, in, in, in the country. Uh, so they warrant preservation. Um, and this is out of this need to take preventive uh, to, uh, to take preventive measures, we decided then uh, that it is time, hence the title of, of the presentation, to race against time and mitigate the threats and try to uh, preserve and document the wrecks ahead of, you know, uh, just being one step ahead of the uh, legislation uh, since time is not our ally. So, what we are aiming to do is to compile a detailed database and the data set of all the known wrecks. Uh, it will include also, it does, um, but you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a work in progress. It includes all the information that we have so far uh, about potential uh, uh, wrecks, wreck sites. We sometimes, you know, the diving, uh, diving at these wrecks, uh, we, we go to them, we, we, uh, we know them by their popular name, but not by their official name. Okay, so many of these ships do not have a, um, an official identity, as it were, but they are known by their local nicknames. So we are trying to mitigate this, uh, this lack of, of information. 
Um, we aim at using this data to, as I said, monitor uh, the uh, deterioration of ships, whether this is due to uh, and all the, you know, due to the challenges that I already spoke about. Um, it is very essential uh, to raise awareness and promote responsible diving. Uh, we are very keen on engaging the general public by introducing them to our recent underwater cultural heritage and try to see, you know, uh, to, for them to build a connection with this heritage, not just by putting memorabilia and, and uh, ex votos and, and whatnot. Um, and our ultimate aim is surely to mitigate the threats and push for the protection, protection of frac sites. And I will uh, leave you with that final slide, well, final slide for my bit before Sergio takes over. So who, who is doing this project? So it's, it's funded by the Honor Frost Foundation and uh, it is undertaken by HFF uh, Lebanon. Um, so you can see this um, woman uh, on the, you know, crazy <laughs> wet on the, uh, on the slide here. That's me, I'm the director of the project, Sergio. Um, it bears with me as the field supervisor. We have our wonderful chief diver, Mario, who's been with us since uh, forever. Uh, Edmond uh, Tonus, our photography and photogrammetry expert. So please, all you nerds of photogrammetry and photography, who you have any questions, it will be to him at the end of the session. Uh, and then we have our genius GIS IT uh, person who's an archaeologist as well, Enzo Coca, Dr. Enzo Coca, and uh, my wonderful students, uh, Fatima, Sirin, and Serge, participating as archaeologists and uh, divers in the team. And I will leave you now with Sergio uh, presenting the methodology and how we go about about uh, doing the project actually yeah so let's dive in into the project itself the methodology how it goes uh, before actually diving into it let's talk about uh, the desk-based research it's not all diving and fun a lot of it is sitting on your laptop going through the library uh, checking all the archives all the pictures you can gather uh, and then after we do that after we upload all the data, all the information we got, then we get the chance uh, to actually dive and do and, you know, start the fun part. Uh, and all of this data that's gathered through desk-based research or through field investigation ends up in the database, in the HFF plugin for QGIS. This is the system we use, our database. Uh, so with the desk-based research, we do literary sources. We go through uh old newspapers old books this one on the right is about a french submarine that was actually sunk during the allied offensive of 1941 uh, and we go through previous studies previous uh like lucy mentioned earlier this idea of this project started in 2015 uh with the thesis of an old hff scholar uh, then we consult the maps the charts the pilots to uh, you know, gather the data uh, and understand, have a navigational understanding of the landscape and the seascape, uh, the distributions of the shipwreck along the coast and off the coast, their location, uh, understand the reasons of uh, the floundering and so on. Uh, then we look for the pretty old pictures. They uh, and the drawings they actually feed into the narrative the historical narrative and uh, you know they are part of this cultural heritage uh, and they are useful because we can use them as comparative material uh, between the ship and the shipwreck so we see the old pictures of the ship we have new pictures of the, of the shipwreck we compare them we see what changed how they degraded over time uh, and then the most boring fun part is actually going through the pages and pages of archives of the archives online mostly through lloyd's register foundation which provide a, a digital resource including lloyd's register of ships online so all the ships registered in the world 
and the Lawyer's Register of Casualty to all the ships that have sunk from the 19th century until the present. And yes, we have to go through all of these archives to try and find our, uh, our shipwrecks. Uh, more on that later. We also use wrecksite.eu that gives us the pretty charts and uh, the known information on these shipwrecks. We use also uboat.net. It's actually a cool website. Uh, it shows you all the casualties, all the sinkings that happened in World War II due to U-boat action, including the U-boats themselves sinking. And we do have a few shipwrecks that have sunk near the coast of Lebanon that could potentially be found uh, in the future. And then we have the Maris data. It's actually a Dutch uh, database for all ships registered uh, by the Dutch. Thank you, uh, Netherlands. Uh, the fun part, which I actually like, is the oral history of these ships. Uh, the wrecking events of many of them are, you know, the event is still alive in people's memory because they're recent. And uh, divers often report to each other their location. They show and brag uh, with the pictures that they take. And it's really important to talk to these people. And we get a lot of information from these divers and the dive clubs. And we thank them very much. Uh, we also have a marine geophysical survey. So this is surveys using uh, remote sensing equipment, like the multi-beam uh, and the single beam eco sounders, the side scan sonars, and the magnetometer. So in this picture, you can see targets uh, which were picked up by the magnetometer. They, uh, these are magnetic contacts and, contacts. and since we deal with metal ships, these can be very useful to us. Uh, once all of this desk-based research, well, this is ongoing, it's never finished. Uh, so we also go into the field. Uh, and going into the field means doing ground truthing operations, uh, through diver-based surveys and doing the photogrammetry of the wrecks and the wreckage that we actually find. Um, and of course, all of this data will eventually be uploaded to the database. Uh, so this is uh, an example of how we do things. Uh, first, we, with maritime archaeology in general, you need to do double planning. You need to plan the actual archaeological work, but you also need to plan the dive, the, the technical aspect of the dives themselves, because we are sending human beings into the depths of the sea. So that needs a lot of training and a lot of planning so that everything goes smoothly and safely. Uh, so we identify uh, and delineate a survey area using QGIS. It's a useful tool. Uh, then we consult the database. We see what are the targets in this area. We prioritize them. So if we know there's a shipwreck there, if we're looking through magnetic contacts, we look at the magnetic uh, you know, uh, intensity of the contact. And this is how we prioritize targets. Then we plan the dives. And planning the dives takes some time. We do that several days before the actual dive. Uh, and of course, brief everyone. So everyone's prepared when we go to field. Then once we decide that the weather is nice, everyone's ready, we go to on the boat, we sail to the target location, uh, we brief everyone again, and we perform our ground truthing uh, dives. And uh, basically, we choose a survey pattern in this picture. You can see actually a GPS track of our dive. So this is us underwater, moving underwater. We usually go for circular searches as you can see uh, and when we find uh, wreckage artifacts everyone's ready for it we take photographs with scale with north arrow we draw sketches and we take the coordinates of this artifact uh, it is very important that everyone is very well trained uh, the team has been going through training for years now so everyone's comfortable and everyone can work efficiently. The team is, of course, in short. Uh, and, you know, sometimes wrecks, they're in deep waters. So 
we need to go through a lot of training to know how to operate in deep waters, how to use nitrox, which is oxygen enriched air, so that we can work efficiently in depths. Uh, we have a variety of tools uh, in our hands when we go down. Uh, our recording tools are the measure tape, of course, uh, the scale bars, which you can see in the middle with the red and white and the north arrow. We use a GPS tracker. So how do you use them? Uh, we tie them into a, into a floating device, a buoy, and we attach them to a reel, which the diver will uh, hold and take with him while he's diving. Basically, the GPS on the surface is always tracking movement. So this is how we know where we're going. Uh, and we also have uh, the photogrammetry markers. Up on the left, the white squares, these are used for photogrammetry. Uh, it facilitates the process of, uh, you know, images identifying each other, basically. They're made from metal, and we sometimes attach railings on them so that we can uh, attach them to vertical surface, surfaces. These things we put on the racks while we're performing photogrammetry. Uh, these are the cameras that we use. We have the GoPros to document everything quickly. We have the Canon 5D Mark III, Eddie's baby. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> and this is Eddie actually doing photogrammetry in the middle of the picture in blue. He's hovering above the wreck doing his thing. The white squares are actually the uh, photogrammetry targets that we talked about. And you can see them here up on the right. We usually mark them. Uh, so that we know exactly where to put them on the rack. Uh, so the methodology of the photogrammetry is twofold. We have two teams. Uh, the first team is the deploy team. And what the deploy team does, they go down, they recon, they do a reconnaissance of the site. Everyone goes down, everyone gets familiar with the site. Uh, and then, you know, that doesn't need to be the same dive. Uh, their job also is to carry all that equipment underwater, prepare everything for Eddie so he can uh, you know, just go down and do his photogrammetry. So they basically deploy these photogrammetry markers that I showed you. They deploy the scales in specific parts of the wreck and they measure any features on the wreck. Uh, you can see a sketch on the left drawn by Eddie because I couldn't do that at all. And this is how this facilitates the planning. We can divide the rec into sections and divide the tasks between the team members of the deploy team. And this, you know, it's efficient. Everyone knows what they're doing. And uh, yeah, so when the deploy team finishes, actually, they surface. They tell the photogrammetry team what's up if they need to do anything. And then the photogrammetry team goes down and starts photographing the whole rec. Uh, so how the photogrammetry is done, it, uh, Eddie goes down, takes pictures of the whole wreck uh, from many angles. Every picture, uh, they're successive, so every picture has to have 50% overlap with the next picture so that uh, they can all be added and uh, processed on, in the software. Uh, here you can see, you know, the blue uh, squares are actually all the fo individual photographs. Uh, all of those we input into Agisoft Metashape, and then, but before that, Eddie has to color correct all these pictures, which is uh, tiring, I know. Uh, once we put all these pictures in Metashape, the magic starts happening. The, the software processes it into a cloud and then into a dense cloud, and this generates a mesh, which is the actual object, and then finally the software generates the texture, and the model is ready to be exported and used. Now, because we measured the shipwreck and we used the scale bars, the, ship, the, the models themselves are accurate, are to scale. So we can use the actual models to measure parts of the shipwreck or the whole shipwreck. Uh, and so basically, the results of all of our work since 2020, we've done 130 dives. That's a total of almost 6,000 hours of work underwater. We've surveyed so far 67 MSP targets. Uh, and we've done the photogrammetry of four wrecks. Uh, here's an example of a wreck site known as MASH, 
uh, this is actually a very badly damaged wreck that was looted, scrapped, and dispersed over a large area. We've done the photogrammetry of all the pieces we could find. Uh, this is the main hull that we could find. These are the masts. This is the engine, the propeller, and the shaft. Uh, another piece of the wreckage, and another piece of the wreckage. Over, you know, dispersed over almost hundreds of meters. And this is an example how we can use the 3D models, the orthophotos here, to map that wreck across the geographic area. Uh, all of this data is, of course, uploaded to our database. This is the plugin. Uh, we have done uh, specific forms, log forms for our shipwrecks. Here you can see that we can enter all the details that we know through the research that we've done, uh, the description of the wreck, what we've done on it, the history of this wreck, uh, the measurements that we know of, or the measurements that we take underwater, we can add them here. The position of the wreck, the coordinates, how accurate they are, the depth, how accurate the depth is, is the site accessible, uh, how is the wreck, how is the seabed composition, is it sandy or rocky, because that affects the environment, affects the, the wreck itself, of course. Uh, and we also, of course, upload all of our individual dives. Every single dive has a dive ID, uh, who dived, how long, how much air did he use up, they use up the pictures that we took, the tasks that we've done, and the results of every individual dive. This is important so we can follow the progress of, uh, of the project. Now, let's take a case study. The cement wreck, or that's at least the nickname of this unknown, yet unknown wreck. Uh, we have done the 3D modeling. Uh, I think it's pretty. I think it's, uh, we did a good job with it, and Eddie did a good job with it. Although uh, it is still in low resolution, uh, we're going to process it into high resolution now that we have a proper desktop. Uh, this track is unidentified, as I said, sunk between 1936 or 1939. We're not sure yet. It is 35 meters long, uh, five mm -hmm. to six meter, uh, meters wide, and uh, had uh, was over carrying cargo, maybe five tons more than it should have carried, and this is why it sunk probably. It is a very popular dive spot between 35 and 43 meters deep, and it is very rapidly deteriorating. We can literally see that through the years. If you compare here the 2017 picture to 2021, you can see the railings on top have completely disappeared. The, the railing on the bow is almost gone. Uh, there's a lot of structural damage that is very evident, and this is because the wreck is not protected at all. Uh, ships can anchor on it, uh, and this is, and you know, the nets can damage the structure, structural integrity of it. This is probably what's happening here. Uh, so, we did the 3D modeling of it, we recorded the site, but what about the ship's identity? How do we find out? Because this is part of our object objective, is identify the ship. Uh, so, part of it is through oral history. Uh, so in this example, the cement track, it's called Michael's ship because as everyone keeps uh, telling the story, Michael was a Greek sailor, used to get drunk a lot, hence the funny picture, I hope you recognize the reference, uh, and because of his drunkenness, uh, sailed the ship, which was overweight, into bad weather, and eventually, and it sank very close to shore. Uh, but, you know, oral history is not always reliable. There's sometimes truth in it. So we have to go through the records. So people say it sunk between 1936 and 1939. So obviously we go through all the archives, uh, the Lloyd's Register, which has, you know, which has all the ships registered in it and all the ships lost throughout uh, the years of 1936. We actually go from 1936 to 1940 and even more if we don't find any evidence. So that's a lot of digging into the archives to try and find any evidence of a ship that sunk in this location in Lebanon. Uh, the orthophotos, which is generated by the 3D models, allow us to take more time and investigate the wreck. We have all the time we need. We don't, we're not diving. We don't have a limited air supply. We can just sit on the laptop and look for features. And, you know, first glance, what you can see here in the top uh, picture, I think that's a boiler. I'm no expert in this. And if there's 
people who are experts in uh, modern ships or steamers at least you could maybe verify that this is actually a boiler uh, and the this picture in the in the bottom picture is actually the windlass the winch that operates the anchor i think these are maybe diagnostic features that could tell us a lot about the ship at least now we know it was a steamer and not diesel operated so you know probably built between the early 1900s to you know the 30s or whenever they stopped really building steamers i'm no expert in that so if anyone knows please help us later let us know what you think and uh yeah on to lucy to tell us about any future prospects thank you um so far we have presented our um work uh, very modestly in the ispsa but uh, we are hoping that we can move the project forward and uh, have uh, several benefits including using these shallow sites for uh, training and field school purposes because some of these wrecks are quite close to the shore and they are quite shallow so easy for uh, newbies uh, to operate um, around um, we need all the assistance, as Sergio uh, said, from naval uh, architects, but also from marine biologists and ecologists to understand how the environment specifically affects the wrecks and vice versa. Um, we hope that, uh, you know, because uh, diving has its limitation, we hope that we can use um, the technology to help us visualize and ground truth uh, via remote sensing techniques, uh, wrecks that are in deep waters. Um, we are sharing our progress and news on social media and we continue to do so. We are very much keen, as I said, on um, sharing with you uh, in academic circles and wider for wider audiences. Um, our work and get all the advice that we um, we can. Um, this is uh, the decade of ocean sciences, so we are, um, you know, just quietly, modestly um, attempting to achieve uh, a, a goal of uh, the decade. Uh, we are also, we have started uh, collabor collaborative talks with other citizen science initiatives such as uh, GERT and so on. Um, we have also prepared a diver awareness campaign um, and uh, these are the cool friends of Sergio, not my friends. Um, <laughs> that are in a band and uh, they have performed the concert with using our imagery in the background. So this is quite interesting to explore how um, artists can uh, perceive the heritage and how can they, you know, create their own story around it. Uh, we have also uh, been quite active um, on social media. This is, I will attempt to show you this. This is just a small trailer that we did. And so this is the kind of, you know, small, um, wider audience um, initiative to get as much interest as, as we can. And on to the more serious um, initiatives that we try to do is come up with a management and protection plan for some of these wrecks because, for example, the SS Lesbian was built in 1923 
And so in a couple of years, it will become, it will reach the 100 uh, year old benchmark and will become archaeology. Uh, however, this wreck is located just as I said before at the entrance of the harbor um, of Beirut. It appears on the side scan uh, sonar below. Uh, we, you just need to move the, uh, the circle just a tiny bit. Sorry, that was a mistake. Um, and we can, you know, install, create a buffer zone around it, uh, monitor the changes to the seabed, monitor the uh, corrosion uh, rate uh, of it by installing these types of smart boys and um, acoustic uh, uh, modems. Um, the, the, this has been, you know, done in, in the Mary Rose, and I'm sure that um, it has been done as well in, as far as I know, in Australia. And so we are, you know, we wish that someday we would see the same, um, the, the same installation uh, for the modern wrecks of Lebanon as well. Um, and we can also monitor access to, to this wreck and, and others by um, having, for example, specific permits for diving, by creating heritage trails, and so on. So overall, uh, this was a, a not so rapid overview of our project. Please don't forget to follow us for more news on this project and other projects by the Honor Frost Foundation. Um, thank you so much for listening. We, we realize we've been talking about for the past hour, so apologies for that and hope you enjoyed the lecture. Thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you, Lucy. Thank you, Sergio. No need to apologize, my goodness. Uh, thank you so much. That's <laughs> it. We can see you. Shall I turn my camera on? You can see me then. Uh... Sure. No, that was brilliant. Thank you so much. And there are so many parallels I can see from uh, with ourselves yeah. here in, in the UK. Um, it's just e almost exactly the same in terms of the threats and the risks and the, the changes to the site and the, the way in which you're uh, undertaking the documentation and the desk based stuff. Um, it's just uh, incredible. And you're, you're doing this with, with, with previous conversations with blackouts of electricity loss for hours at, at a time sometimes. Yeah. It's incredible. We can't yeah, even get it. Very true. Even... It's been very challenging to operate. Hang on a minute. There's literally a cat fight that we're <laughs> trying to solve. <laughs> oh, brilliant. No, no problem. No, no, it's okay. But yeah, you're right about the challenges. You know, we've had all sorts of challenges from electricity to fuel challenges to, you know, political unrest, all of that factored in. But we still managed to do what we could, so that's nice. It's insp it's inspirational, Sergio. It really is. It's a lovely way to end the series um, with with this, uh, with Lucy starting us back in January and then finishing it off uh, in December. I, I think it's amazing. Um, yeah, we we have the ghost fishing issue of the fishing nets and the fishing lines all over the place. Um, uh, we struggle. I I can't even get a, a, a protected designated wreck buoyed. You know, getting a buoy on it is impossible the, the authorities don't want to do it so i mean it's it's inspirational um you um i was going to ask a question about involving they have big other... dreams now of how course. much they're gonna get re you know realize it we're, we'll see but um, uh, absolutely you've got to we shoot do what them. we can with what we have so far absolutely i was going to ask the question about involving other divers recreational technical divers to assist you and you kind of you you pointed towards that at the end in terms of training uh, other people to widen the the team, presumably, because you had how many did you have? Two hundred and sixty-two potential targets, uh, and you've and looked counting. at sixty-seven and counting. Of course, because it's only ever going to grow, isn't it? Yeah. How do you say? Well, what? knowing Lebanon and all the conflict that <laughs> happened, <laughs> like <your> less targets. <laughs> you know, just. Uh, it's, I mean, it's it's very sad, but just the harbor of Beirut explosion got, you know, future archaeologists some work. Yeah, mm. oh gosh. And um, uh, yeah, so we live in a very exciting uh, country. It was amazing to, to see, say the, the least. Uh, to say the least. It was amazing to see the photographs from the diver who's been in on some of the sites since the explosion uh, in terms of the, 
the the I don't know the sonic wave or the sonic boom that happens um, that's resulted in further rapid de deterioration. Yeah, and, and that's a wreck that is between 60 and 70 meters of depth. Gosh, I would say thank heavens nobody was in the water at the time. So, yeah. Um, somebody's Anyhow. asked the question, Hugh, Hugh has asked the question about have you set depth limitations for yourself? Have you, you know, what's the deepest site that you've looked at or want to look at? Is there a limit? Well, of, of course, that depends on the whole team. This is why we're training. Last year, we didn't have the same capacity as this year, uh, so to speak, because we've been training to, into using night trucks, into uh, diving in deeper and deeper levels, deeper depths. So there is a limit. Getting technical training as of well. Of course. So, yeah, the, the deepest we've done so far is actually the case study of the cement track at 40, 42 meters. That's the deepest we've gone. Uh, yeah. But uh, the Honor Frost Foundation has has purchased a new uh, piece of equipment for the HFF Lebanon team. Yay, me. Yay, uh, yay us. Us. <laughs> yay, us. <laughs> Uh, which is an ROV, um, and so that will um, help us explore deeper, deeper depths in 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 a safer way. And the polluted uh, sure. waters, also there. And yeah. The yeah. Because yeah, I the other worry that we have is is the amount of pollution in certain areas, which are shallow, not necessarily deep, but yeah, you wouldn't want to mm -hmm. dive there. You will get like with half an eye Mutations. and yeah get an arm growing or something this, this is all look but don't touch sort of monitoring um documentation at this stage isn't it so but presumably yeah. you've also got munitions in the water uh as in weaponry uh shells yes, yes. At, we have with the period the time period that you're dealing with skeletons so, as well uh, some wrecks have you know torpedoes on the deck still there and what about polluting uh, oil or leaking oil from anything it's a good question. Uh, it has been done already. I think it's just <laughs> it's <been> taken. <laughs> <laughs> but th there is a good point. I mean, if you find a wreck, a new wreck, completely untouched, I mean, people still kind of empty uh, the, the oil and uh, fuel from all shipwrecks. So that might, you know, that's a mitigation of uh, threats that, you know, is part of the objectives. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so do you know to the the wreck and the wreck to the environment. <laughs> out of interest, do you know what depth rating your ROV has? Your new toy? How uh, deep can it go? Uh, our cable reaches 150 meters. Yeah. But that that could always be upgraded and you know, depending on the ROV itself, of course. Exciting. Yeah, there you go. Exciting. <laughs> uh uh, one of your friends and colleagues, I'm sure, Nassim, has asked, what's your biggest difficulty you face so far? It's a, big a lot of difficulties. <laughs> it's a big question. Are you even Lebanese, Nassim, when you're asking this question? Um, no, <laughs> on more serious matters. It's, it has been really the living condition more than anything else. Uh, we are trying to operate with a very limited budget, uh, we must say, and trying to uh, get by safely, uh, monitor the um, everyday access to roads, for example, if there are no protests going on, if uh, there are no road closures with... Uh, with fire burning tires, um, access to fuel has been difficult uh, because of the uh, recent fuel crisis we, we've been facing, a rise in prices, uh, hyperinflation, and a lack of expertise uh, in, in the sense that, um, you know, there are very few meta rec specialists in term. This is not really neither our uh, period so we're, being developed, we're, though. we're trying yeah yeah we're <laughs> learning we're almost there <laughs> we're learning as we go um we need the naval architect on board we need you know there there are so many niche uh expertise that that we can and there's always also the unpredictability of the weather 
you know, when you want to do photogrammetry, you really want good yeah. visibility. And sometimes you prepare, you get everyone on board, yeah. you bring all the gear, you pay for everything, you go there, and then you can't see more than your nose. <laughs> and then everything needs to be cancelled. Yeah. Or you do parts of it, and then the currents comes in and everything changes. And you yeah. can't proceed, or the colors change between one day and the other. So, the, yeah, this is this is challenging. Uh, but that's nature. I mean, what can you do? Oh, yes. In the... Uh, in... In the United Kingdom with the English Channel, the weather, the visibility, exactly. I understand that completely. And I'm not people, complaining. <laughs> no, 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 of course. <laughs> people in presentations only ever see the good photographs with a nice visibility because, of course, you don't show or you don't collect the data. You don't work because the conditions are so bad. Yeah, yeah. but I'd say all the other... Um, and uh, this is really a project that despite COVID, we've been a bit, you know, able to go out at sea. Um, and and it's been you know we, we received great support from the foundation for it to be flexible with with our grant so we we thank them enormously yes um but yeah it's been it's been tough uh we've got a question a specific one about the database are you using it says the question is what application do you use for the database can you talk through that a bit more it's um it's a plugin uh for uh, QGIS that is done by Enzo Coca our uh, IT specialist um it was a bit uh it mirrored the the HFF plugin that uh, we use in archaeological surveys so uh, Enzo and Sergio and I designed a template specifically that would answer the needs of this project I think it's written in Python code, but I'm no expert. Um, if if the person who's asking needs more more information, uh, they can drop me an email. I can send it to Enzo, and they, you know, they can he can take it from there. Brilliant, thank you. Yes, do do reach but it's out. QGIS to mainly okay. it's a plugin for QGIS. Well, I've got a question about the. Um, uh, I'm aware of Lebanon's heritage as a multicultural and multilingual society. Which language and why uh, are, are you principally recording in? In Arabic, French, English, a mix match, depending on your audience, etc. Yeah, well, I think... The recording of the data? Uh, I, I, I suppose so. It uh, uh, says which language I mean, and why recording the project in. So presumably the data is going in the database in English, it looked like. Yes. Yeah, that will be English. But yeah, yeah, the interviews we conduct with people is in spoken Arabic, mm. um, which is a mix of, of, of Arabic and, and spoken Lebanese, which is a mix of yeah. spoken Arabic, French and, and, and English. Some of the research we do, you know, we get French records, French. Uh, yeah. So we also use that. So yeah, Lebanese. <laughs> uh, Nassim has replied saying, yes, it's in Python, by the way. Thank you, Nassim. Okay. <laughs> uh, we've got a question from uh, Tony saying, do you have marine ecologists who are interested in the, in the wrecks and could work or want to work with you? Not that I know of yet, but we have talked about this. Yeah. It's actually interesting uh, getting uh, ecology into the picture because like we said, uh, the environment affects the wreck, but the wreck also affects the environment and you find interesting uh, ecology in these wrecks. So definitely, hopefully in the future, if we have anyone that can be on board, that's a big plus. Okie dokie. Uh, gosh, the questions are coming in thick and fast. Um, somebody said, as an architect and technical diver, would love to know if there are any plans to involve technical divers who do not have archaeological background in the project. Uh, I think we've kind of answered that, Aline, actually. I think they are hoping to be training people soon so if you are around in country uh, or can get to i think it would be worth following up with uh, lucy and sergio afterwards uh right what else we got um from adam when first finding a shipwreck uh how much time roughly does it take before this information is released to the public these you mean the the wrecks are already known by the diving community since since the 50s really many of your um, targets will be known ones won't they 
yeah yeah but uh i mean the the way it works is that we you know it start we start building the puzzle as it were so you go from the known to the unknown so you start exploring the wrecks that I mean, are already because it's a question of of, of uh, documenting ahead of destruction so we target mainly the popular diving sites to be able to record as much as we can before them getting altered with time so yeah it's, a, no, it's an interesting point i mean if say we find suddenly a world war one shipwreck do we want to immediately say we found it and here it is and everything will that be bad in the short run hmm. Uh, because we don't have any laws, any monitoring, so could that be bad? Should we do it? Should we wait? Should we do it in a specific way? I mean, usually we share everything on the social media. Uh, but yeah, if we find sensitive spots, you want to handle it in a specific way so that you minimize damage to it. Yeah. But of course, we're not hiding anything from everyone. We want everyone to be involved in it in a proper way. I suppose you'll, you'll have to cross that bridge when you come to it, as we might say. Um, uh, and actually, if you spend too much time with your boat and divers on something, it might come out quite quickly that, you know, people will notice that you're there and, yeah. and go and investigate what it is that you've, that you happen to be diving on. Yeah, yeah but exactly because the, we started so far, that our experience has been on, on known dive sites. So, you know, we're just a bunch of divers among many others. So, yeah. Yeah, we, the, my experience of finding something new is that generally speaking, you're not the first person to find it new. Somebody else found it, but they just didn't, they managed to keep it a bit quiet. Of course, of course, especially the fishermen, you know, they know the sea more than yeah. we will ever know. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But in terms, you know, of 3D modeling, for example, if we 3D model a wreck, how long will it take until it's published? We usually takes, you know, depending on the equipment we have, depending on the site, a couple of weeks, a bit more, until we, you know, generate the, the the model, we refine it, and then we can share it with everyone else. So yeah. And also, it's it's different when when sites are archaeology. Um, we are dealing with what is officially not recognized as archaeology but had were we working if we were working on an archaeological site then we need to go back to the laws that you know uh um, um oversee our work as maritime archaeologists which are the same exactly the same as uh archaeologists working on land and the uh it's the Ge general directorate of antiquities under the ministry of culture that dictates you know the legal framework within which we operate as as a team of archaeologists um and what we are allowed to uh to say about this site and what we're not allowed to say and where and which outlets and and so on so is is that distinction between what's archaeological and what's not based on the hundred year rule on the law yeah yeah yeah, and this is what we try to show in, in this presentation that it's, you know, age is just a number because, you know, you've got this wonderful resource and um, and whether it, you consider other in other countries, it's considered archaeology. In Lebanon, it's not yet because, you know, we follow the UNESCO 2001 convention uh, for anything that is related to the um, uh, regulating underwater cultural heritage. Of course, so the um, the the anniversary of World War One, 2014, 2018, suddenly yeah, I mean, you know, vast but, amounts of underwater yeah, heritage became archaeological. Already, the the Victoria, the HMS Victoria that trekked in Tripoli is is part of of uh, is archaeological now. Um, and soon, uh, the uh, wrecks that we mentioned, uh, like the cement wreck, in a few years it will be, uh, the SS uh, Lesbian it will be uh, as Next well. Year. Yeah. Next year, yeah. Yep. Yeah. So, we've, we've got uh, a couple more minutes for questions, folks, if you want to get any in. We've got one from Truman asking, how common is it for wrecks to be unidentifiable? No identity has been found. Well, a lot. <laughs> a lot most of them, because we don't have a clear record of them, uh, especially like the site uh, I showed you smashed, it's just pieces of wreck. So what we're doing is 
almost forensic. Uh, we're finding these pieces, we're comparing them with other pieces of other wrecks, try to see what these wrecks are. Are they steamers? Are they modern? Uh, you know, if you find a specific kind of engine, you kind of guess that, okay, this was built in the 40s maybe. Uh, but a lot of them are not identified at all. It's still going on, the process of it. I'm still going through the archives, the never-ending archives, <laughs> to try and identify <laughs> But we're getting there. I mean, we're getting there. And Some the of them we've already identified, actually. The difficulty with identification then becomes a difficulty of dating, which then becomes a difficulty of is it archaeology or not? Yes. Because if you yes, don't know, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah the very, line is blurred. Yeah. Yeah, it's very tricky. But the the thrill of searching through the archives. <laughs> it's, it's what? But it's, yeah, it's, it's all relative, you know? Oh, I mean, yes, absolutely. I think it's not archaeology three. now, but you know, it's it. We will be gone, and it will stay. So it will be archaeology. Absolutely, I bet you enjoy that archive work, really, don't you? No, I actually do. I actually yeah. Do. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Any more questions, folks? Any more? I think we have uh, bravo and thank you and well done. Lots of wonderfuls. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks. People that have been saying nice things. Okay. You can't I... see the chat. Where's the nice things? I want to see, can't see the, the chat. Nice oh, you should be able to see the chat. I would have thought, as as panelists, uh, in the control panel. Anyway, you, you have a little look for it while we uh, while I try to work out which screen to share with everybody. Right. Okay. So chat. we'll keep. There we go. You you yeah. please look at the questions. You look at the questions and see what other people have said amazingly about you and how great you all are. Uh, I'm just going to wrap this up then, folks, while Lucy and Sergio are enjoying themselves um, uh, and glory and praise being bestowed upon them. Thank you, everybody. Thank you to Lucy and Sergio for wrapping up Thank our webinar so series. Thank you to everybody for attending today and for all the attendance over the 12 webinars to date. Uh, we'll compile some stats. Uh, in the next couple of uh, weeks to work out how many people and how many views and everything has taken place over 12 months. You can find a recording uh, or you will find a recording of today's webinar probably by the close of play tomorrow. I'm going to try and get the recording done. I've got a little window tomorrow to do that. It'll be uploaded onto our YouTube channel uh, tomorrow. We'll put it out on social media with a link as well and share it with Lucy and Sergio so they can promote it too. Um, you can also on that web uh, YouTube channel find recordings of all the other webinars in the series, uh, as well as other recordings of other presentations that we've done, uh, particularly with the IGNA and as part of our COVID series. So on behalf of the NES, uh, on behalf of our sponsors, uh, the Honor Frost Foundation, without whom much of your work uh, and much of our work would not be possible. Uh, thank you to everyone for joining us. We hope you all have uh, good holidays. Uh, over the Christmas and New Year period. If you celebrate Christmas, I hope Santa is kind. I hope you've been good boys and girls. Uh, if not, well, enjoy yourselves. Have a restful period. Uh, stay safe, everybody, and goodbye. Good night, folks. Thank, Thank you very night. much. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Uh, and end.